Hi everyone. Um, wow, another webinar has joined. Um, wow, I can't believe it's absolutely freezing to those of you who are, are not based in Joburg. Um, we are freezing to death, all of us here in Fouting. Um, thanks so much for everyone who's joining us this evening. I think it's going to be a really, really good discussion. And we're really looking forward to becoming a little more educated, um, knowing that it is quite a morbid topic. And um, I guess that that's just the nature, I suppose, of what we have to deal with. But the important thing is obviously that we be responsible about it and that we, we plan accordingly so that we can make sure that the wishes of our loved ones are known. So I'm going to jump right in and I'm going to introduce you to our speakers. So the first up is um, Dr. Ali, um, Manaz Ali, and many of you might know her from her work as a pediatric palliative care practitioner. Um, Manaz is based at Bitspal and Lombano Sanctuary, and she fell into palliative care about six years ago, and it's grown to be her passion. We refer lots of patients through to Manaz, and uh, she's helped many of our patients right towards the end of life. She really does feel strongly about improving the quality of life for both children with life-limiting and life-threatening illnesses, as well as their families, and as well as advocacy and training around what constitutes good palliative care. So we're really grateful to have her joining us this evening and um, hoping that we all get educated on what palliative care is and also debunking some of the myths. So over to Manaz. Manaz, are you there? Yes, I am. And I've sent the doggies away. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. I'm going to put your video on. Is that fine? Fine. Perfect. There we go. It should send you a request. Oh, there Good we stuff. go. Maybe I should just move a bit back. Good stuff. Okay. And off so, you go. Hi, everyone. Um, as Kelly says, my name is Dr. Ali and I do pediatric palliative care in Johannesburg. So more about, I'm going to talk a little bit about palliative care in general, um, not just the pediatric section. So it's quite a highly specialized field um, and we used an interdisciplinary approach to deal with people that have either life limiting or life threatening illnesses. And with this, we need to understand that it's an approach. It's not exactly a treatment. And when I talk about people with life limiting or life threatening illnesses, I'm talking about people that with life limiting people that do not, won't have the best quality of life and they won't live fully to the best of their abilities. Somebody with cerebral palsy, brain damage, traumatic brain injuries. With life-threatening illnesses, we're talking about people that have terminal cancer, um, terminal heart disease or kidney failure. So somebody that will imminently die from their disease. We focus more on an active total care of the whole patient, the patient's body, mind and spirit, and we include the family as much as possible. If we're dealing with little kids, if we're dealing with the pediatric population, we try and include the children as well as the siblings in most of our discussions. Um, the child is who matters to us the most, and that's our primary concern. With palliative care, we aim to relieve a lot of the pain and other distressing symptoms. And distressing symptoms towards the end of life would be not eating, not drinking, uh, a lot of secretions, and most distressing is the anxiety and the pain. Um, we need to understand that with palliative care, we neither hasten nor postpone death. And we use this process to affirm life as a normal process. And we regard death and dying as a normal process. We use an interdis interdisciplinary approach to support the patient and allow the patient to live as actively as possible until they die. And we also help the family to cope the family to cope during this illness, as well as we support the family for a process afterwards during their bereavement. The main aim of palliative care is to enhance the quality of life of the patient and allow them to die with dignity. And just to dispel a few myths about palliative care, it's not reserved for those that are dying. It is applicable early on in the course of a disease. We find that if we get the patient at the time of diagnosis, it's easier to walk this path, easier to plan along and do a care plan for the patient and help manage them a little bit better. And it also helps with the family when we do a lot of counseling. Um, it's just not when curative treatment fails. We don't need to wait for the curative treatment or the doctors to say there's nothing more that we can do before we call in the palliative care team. So 
We urge all doctors and all healthcare professionals to call us as early as possible so that we work together. It's just not reserved for elderly people. We are finding more and more kids that are being referred to us and children that are just born. I mean, neonates, a lot of neonates with genetic or congenital abnormalities are um, these days referred to us. And it's just not reserved for those with cancer. There's a multitude of diseases that can benefit from palliative care. And diseases in children and adults differ. I mean, the course of the illness differs, the prognosis differs, and their lives often differ. So it's just not reserved for those that are elderly. And it's just not applicable in a hospice setting. We can do palliative care in any setting. So we have a lot of people that do palliative care in primary um, care facilities, primary clinics. And these are trained nurses. We also do palliative care at the hospital. We can do it in a patient's home or we can do it in, in an institution. And the institutions are like hospice or step down facility. And the connotation is that it's a hospice. It's where people go to die. And it's not necessarily true. We have to dispel those myths about death and dying. Um, it's also quite a myth that pain is a big part of dying. And if we control pain with morphine, that morphine would lead to addiction. So that is a myth that I want to dispel. Morphine does not cause addiction. It helps the patient cope a lot better. It even helps with distressing symptoms like breathing. And when we look at controlling somebody's pain, we need to understand that pain is just not physical. There's lots of components to pain. We deal with mental pain, spiritual pain, emotional pain, and psychological pain. And these can manifest as physical pain. The other myth I'd like to dispel is about morphine. We use morphine quite a lot, and we use it in children as young as, um, as newborns, and we use it throughout the, the length of the illness. And morphine does not hasten death. It actually eases the pain, it eases the suffering, and in easing that, I suppose it helps the family cope a little bit better. It, it eases their anxiety. It does not just involve nurses. We use a multidisciplinary approach these days and includes a doctor, a nurse, a social worker, a counselor, and we even have spiritual healers that will join us on the journey, depending on the person's religion and faith. And most importantly, palliative care, including the palliative care team, does not mean that the person has to depend on others. It aims to support the person throughout their illness, maintain independence, and ensure that they have a good quality of life. And that's about it, palliative care in a nutshell. Sorry, Manaz, thank you very, very much. Um, one of the questions that I wanted to ask is, um, it's actually a question that's come through from Helen Malherber from Genetic Alliance. And with the mainstream focus of pediatric palliative care being on cancer and HIV, what can we do as patients and support groups, as well as patient advocates, to increase the awareness and implementation of palliative care? I know that a while ago, um, Peds, Pell, and um, uh, Patch, etc., were all circulating a, a palliative care, um, uh, not a survey, a, a sort of a call to action. Yeah, a petition asking for, for support for departments have helped to allocate budget specifically to the implementation of the policy but beyond that what is it that we can do i think i think mainly with doctors i think we need to educate the doctors the doctors don't call us early enough um, a lot of my referrals are either from the the rehab team the speech therapists the ot's the physios they refer a lot of the patients especially when they see that the family is not coping so education is key uh, we try and do it mostly at an undergrad level um, and postgrad it's also available but if we start early I think that's the important thing and a lot of patient advocacy making people aware that palliative care is available to them and that there is a network there is a support system for families that are going through these difficult times and I think everyone I mean if we circulate that petition the, the call to, to sign we need a hundred thousand signature signatures but it's just not for funding, it's also for the government to recognize palliative care and introduce, especially pediatric palliative care um, in all the government hospitals or even all the private hospitals in South Africa. 
Okay, um, I have seen uh, a question coming through here on the chat as well. What is your opinion on feeding, especially tube feeding during palliative care? As I mentioned before, we do not hasten or postpone death. So if we need to feed the patient or the child, we, use, we will use a feeding tube. If the child is terminally ill and cachexic and refusing feeds, and then we can see it's a preterminal condition, we will often advise the parents or the supporters or the caregivers to stop feeding because that will actually prolong the death and the suffering. And it can cause multitude of problems like aspiration, pneumonia, things like that. So in pre-terminal cases, we would advise them not to feed. Otherwise, we're quite keen to use NG tubes, even pig gastrostomy tubes. And we often send patients home on these. So we're all about feeding our patients and keeping them healthy. And it's all about living to the best of their abilities, living as best as they can. Absolutely. I think that that's critical for all of us in this environment is we always use the phrase living beyond just the diagnosis and obviously making sure people are comfortable for as long as possible. Um, Manas, in terms of in terms of referral towards uh, to palliative care services, if this isn't something that is implemented or um, immediately requested from the treating practitioner, as a patient, what can they do to make sure that they access palliative care services? Is it possible to, to approach um, palliative teams directly or do you need a referral? Um, unfortunately, I'm the only doctor in Gauteng practicing pediatric palliative care at the moment. So um, a lot of the referrals are directly from the doctors. Um, the patients, I've had a few patients contact me on Facebook um, they've got my number from other people, support groups, WhatsApp, and they WhatsApp me, you know, they can contact me directly. I do work very closely with a social worker. I mean, sorry, with a social worker and a counselor. And we do go to the hospitals. We do do home visits for the patients if they need it or if they are in a home-based care setting. So they okay. can actually just WhatsApp me, call me, email me. The doctors do refer a lot and even they can approach their medical aides. A lot of the medical aids are away, and um, I think through rare assist as well, because we work quite closely together. Yeah, I think it's. Uh, I think as patient advocacy groups, we've got a lot of work to do in making sure that patients access palliative care. And I, I know from personal experience that, from my perspective, it's sometimes difficult to have that conversation with parents and, and patients because there is this presumption that when you start discussing palliative care, you must ultimately be talking about death. And yeah, so yeah. I think we need to, I think we could all use a little bit of um, guidance on, on having a more comforting conversation that's not necessarily as overwhelming to make sure that patients actually, you know, don't feel as though they're being given their death sentence. Just their by death hearing sentence. the words, absolutely. So I dispel that myth. I tell the patients that we just here for support and counseling. And that's why it's easier to build that relationship up from the beginning rather than being called when the child is preterminal or the person is preterminal and having to have this discussion because now you're seeing as the bad person, the person's breaking the bad news, the person who's pulling the plug, so to speak. So if that discussion happens earlier on, we're able to navigate this journey together and it's a, it proves for a much better outcome. Okay, and uh, I see another question's come through. How does palliative care differ in SA between private and state sector services in SA? Um, it's essentially the same. In private, we in private, unfortunately, I'm the only one, um, and I see all the private patients. So I flit around from hospital to home and back again. In the government, we have um, we have an adult palliative care team based at Barra and we the pediatric team is also based at Barra but we do service all the government hospitals so we spend a day at each of the government hospitals where if there's a need or there's a referral that we do see the patients and our team in public is much bigger we have nurses psychologists social workers and a spiritual care healer unfortunately in private it's just me at the moment and it's it's finding the resources and finding the right team to work with and we're busy building on that at the moment. 
And that's, it's, <clears throat> I find that this multi-systemic, this multi-referral team is actually always much better in the, in the state sector actually ironically than it is in private. So it's, uh, it's quite, it's not really news to me that it's the same with, uh, with palliative care, but I think, I think that that's the general presumption that if you're paying thousands, you must be getting better care in the private sector and it doesn't really. It doesn't necessarily work that way, no. Case. Um, there's one last question that I will do here, and then we'll take questions at the end. Um, the question is, yeah, um, the, this be done as part of the physiotherapy services? Sorry, what was that, Katie? Particularly when there's a living... Sorry, I, I can see my internet is dropping. Um, I can see that this is actually probably going to be relative to Pietra at the end, so don't stress about it for now, Manaz. On reading the full sentence, I can see it's with regards to a living will. So if uh, if I can, I'm going to move over to Bunny. Um, Manaz, you will be staying with us until the end, eh? Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. All right, so without any further ado, I'm going to introduce advocate Bonnie Fenter. Uh, some of you may know Bonnie from the uh, TUL organization, and they focus on transplant education for living legacies. Um, Bonnie is really, really knowledgeable when it comes to um, uh, organ transplants, particularly lung transplants, um, because she is a surviving patient herself, a surviving transplant survivor. And um, I think this is a, a critical issue. So we're always discussing uh, lung transplants, heart transplants, kidney transplants, living transplants, cadaver transplants. But I don't think that there's really much of an understanding uh, with regards to the consenting thereof. And I know um, we had a previous patient, Jenna Lowe, who did a, a huge amount of work with regards to uh, signing up organ donations. But um, Bonnie actually brought it to my attention a couple of months ago that in the event that your family actually doesn't consent, uh, regardless of whether or not you registered as a donor, actually is immaterial because ultimately in that moment, your family has the say. So Bonnie's here to address some of those issues and hopefully get us a little bit more aware as to what we need to do to make sure that our wishes are granted in that regard. So Bonnie, over to you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I just quickly want to correct Kelly there. I'm actually not one of the transplant recipients. Oh. Um, in town, we've got three ladies and the other two are actually recipients. Um, as we joke, I'm more like the spare body. <laughs> um, okay, so they asked this evening to talk about how you become a donor. Um, and what I actually want to focus on is the difference in between what the law says about becoming a donor, what most of society thinks, how you become a donor, and how it actually works in practice, because I think that's often where people start to get confused. Okay, so let me just get this presentation going. Um, just quickly, is the presentation showing? Uh, no, it isn't. Um, have you clicked on that little share screen at the bottom? Yes, I have. Sorry for this. Um, can you see here? Maybe portion of screen. Oh, there we go. Okay, is that working? Yes, we can now see that you need to update your iTunes. <laughs> oh, thank you. Great. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Um, okay, so Kelly already introduced, I'm from Tal. Um, tonight I want to actually start with basically asking, do you in general allow other people to make important decisions for you about your life? So just a few examples I want to bring up while you think about that question is, for instance, would you allow your husband to make the decision about your wedding dress? Or maybe let your mom still choose how you cut your hair or even leave it up to one of your siblings to decide what type of tattoo you're going to get on your body. Okay, the reason why I'm asking this is because it seems that one of the most important decisions of our life or of the legacy we leave behind, we actually do leave up to other people. But I'll get back to that in a second. Okay, so just a brief introduction about organ donation. Even though we are one of the countries that did the first successful heart transplant, we've recently once again did the first successful HIV positive to HIV negative transplant, 
we still seem to struggle a lot with our organ donation numbers. Okay, the reason for this is there's quite a lot, but in general, it's usually blamed on the fact that people fear that they won't receive adequate treatment or that doctors won't treat them and would rather be more concerned about procuring their organs. Another main reason that, we can, or that I'm focusing on specifically tonight is the fact that people don't inform their families of their wishes to be a donor. Okay, or sometimes the family refuse when they approach for consent. And then of course, there's the more vague type of factors like there's a lack of awareness or education and that we have religious and cultural um, ob obstacles as well. Okay, so to get to the law, a few legal instruments that regulate it. So you'll see from an international level, we're regulated down to a South African legislation level. So just internationally quickly, we are actually signatories to the Declaration of Istanbul on organ trafficking and transplant tourism. This, the main aim of this declaration is to stop organ trafficking. And then a bit closer to home, uh, transplants are regulated by the constitution and mainly by the National Health Act. Okay, so if you think about the National Health Act, you have to actually see it as a skeleton. There's basic rules about organ donation and transplant there. So you'll find everything about maybe what age you need to be allowed, how the doctors are allowed to procure, and what institutions they're allowed, and who's allowed to procure. But for the more nitty gritty details, you need to go look at the regulations. And I'm actually going to focus a bit this evening on the regulations and on the Act. Okay, so what I want to start with is to look at the Act. So you'll see. According to the Act, it says if you want to be a donor, you can either make your wishes known in a will or you can sign a document where you have two witnesses with you or you can make an oral statement. But you'll see all of these methods actually have flaws. So if you just think about it for a second, for instance, if you want to use a will, how long does it actually take to administer a will? We know sometimes somebody passes away today and two, three years later, the estate is still dragging on. So that's actually not a valid way to become an organ donor. Okay, the second two options is that you can make your wishes known in a document or you can have an oral statement. Okay, and you need to have two competent witnesses. Once again, you'll see there's flaws in these two options, mainly because organ donation is so um, timelessly constrained that you won't have the time to maybe access these documents or this oral statement. And then of course, you'll see when we talk about practice in a few minutes, none of these documents will be regarded valid by um, the transplant coordinators. Okay, then moving on to how the community or how the society in South Africa thinks you should become an organ donor. Okay, the main way that we've always done this for the last 20, 30 years is you can register as an organ donor with the Organ Donor Foundation. Okay, you'll sign up with them, you'll provide all your details and they'll give you an even organ donor card or you'll get stickers to put onto your driving license and your ID document. Okay, and this is a really great way for us to become organ donors, to start talking about the conversation, and also to have proper statistics around organ donors in South Africa. But the flaw, once again here, is that even though you have that sticker, even though you are registered, when the time comes, they will still approach your family for their final consent. Okay, so just to explain how the process actually works in the hospitals. So what happens is if, let's say today, you are in a motor vehicle accident, what will happen is the donation process will start where one of the medical team will identify you as a potential donor. Remember that not everybody can always be a donor, but here I also want to highlight the fact that you shouldn't actually decide because maybe you like to smoke or because you drink that you cannot be a donor. I always say in this situation, leave it up to the professionals. Just to give you an example, for instance, we've had donors that are as young as six weeks old and we've had donors that are as old as 82, 85 years old. And that is not necessarily the cutoff. So in terms of your health conditions, always leave it up to the medical team to make that decision. Okay, so back to the donation process. So you'll be identified as a potential donor and one of the staff members will then refer you to a transplant coordinator. Okay, so what usually happens, the transplant coordinator's phone and she's told there's a potential donor. Then the transplant coordinator will go to the hospital and only that person who is specialized and is trained will start to have the discussion with the family. It's unfortunately not like Grey's Anatomy where you see somebody storming in all of a sudden and ask if you want to donate your daughter's organs. 
This is really approached with a lot of caution, a lot of emotion, and the transplant coordinator will absolutely assess the situation. They'll never ask a family to donate if they see that the family is not willing to have this conversation. And it's also part of the end of life discussion in general with the family. So they don't only discuss um, the fact of whether the organs or the tissues will be donated. Okay, and then the most important part of this process is moving on to the consent. And this is where the main issue that, or this is the main issue that I want to highlight tonight, is that your family will need to provide that final consent. And according to your family situation, for instance, if you're unmarried, it will most probably be your parents that will provide the consent. If you're married, it could be your spouse. And if you're not married or don't have parents, then usually they will start with your siblings, so an older brother or an older sister. Okay, and only once this consent is provided, it will move on to the donation process. So once again, I just actually want to concentrate on that fact that you can have that organ donor card, you can even have a tattoo on your body that says I'm an organ donor. The transplant coordinators, the treating doctors will ignore that and they will still ask your family for that final consent. And then of course, after the consent is provided, then they'll move over to the transplant process. Okay, so tonight's main topic is about is organ donation an option when faced with terminal illness? And the answer to this is yes. But the most important part of it is that you must have the conversation, the conversation with your family while you still can. Make it clear to them what you want to have done. And in this case, I think it relates to everything in terms of end of life decision, not maybe just necessarily organs. It can be anything that you want at that end of your life. Okay, I think that's it from me. There we go. Wow. Wow, super, super, super interesting. I'm not sure if there's any questions. Bonnie, I'm so sorry. I feel like such an idiot. Um, oh, don't worry. Uh, no, <laughs> it's fine. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure if there's any questions coming through. I can see that there is a question with regards to living wells, but... Um, Maybe then what we should do, I, I have a question. Actually, I'm going to ask it on the poll. I'd, I'd be interested to know how many patients are actually um, organ donors. Um, I know I am, but I also, you know, I presume my family will stick to that. But I, I don't know how I would feel in that moment also, knowing my family's wishes. I suppose it's that desperate sort of rush to want to, fix things and have things different in that moment. So, I, I, you know, it's a very, very tough question, which again, I think is why it's so important to have all these things in order. Um, so I will ask on a poll in the next couple of seconds uh, regarding organ donation to see how many of us are listed here to get an idea. Um, okay. But I'm going to move over to Petra. Um, so Petra is a social worker and a palliative care practitioner. Uh, Pietra's also been in our community for a long time. I've known Pietra for, I think, as long as I've been working in this space. And Pietra obtained her BA degree in social work shortly after she sustained spinal cord injuries in a motor vehicle accident. And um, she's always willing to help with uh, the lives of marginalized groups. And we're very, very grateful to have her on board. Um, Pietra is going to be discussing advanced care directives as well as living wills um, to just determine exactly what's needed to, to put that into place. And I can tell you this webinar particularly has come about from many of our patients over the um, flu season who have got various things from epilepsy type conditions to neuromuscular diseases to spinal problems, um, and all of that. And they've landed up picking up flu and infections, et cetera. And as a result of that, um, they land up becoming quite compromised and many of them have had to go on. To and it's not necessarily um, the pathology or the plan that as a family you had for that particular, you know, when someone gets diagnosed with a particular condition, you think it's going to pan out in a certain way. And then something else crops up and happens and I've seen all these families in utter distress now because they've got their little ones on non-invasive ventilation or trachea, et cetera. And the question is now, you know, do we call it even though 
things haven't necessarily gotten to that point in the way that was initially expected. So I think that that's been one of the main drivers for having this webinar this evening. So without any further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Pietra. Thanks so much, Kelly. Hi, everybody. Yes, uh, you've left me with a difficult conversation now. Okay, so I would like to start with one thing, and that is to ask all of you, there where you're sitting is, do you have a care plan? And you're going to ask me, what is a care plan? And if I talk about a care plan, I'm actually referring to the whole thing of not only end of life and, and do not resuscitate, etc. It's what do you want the day that you die? Do you want to be cremated? Do you have a funeral? Who do you want to have there? Um, some people even have in their care plans that, you know what, the day, the day that I die, I don't want to have a funeral. I would like to have a party because it's completely different. I want them to celebrate my life. I don't want them to grieve my life. Okay, those are the kind of things. But I would like to start there. And I would like to ask all the parents now, you know what? If you walk over the street or you go into the grocery store and you've been in an accident and both you and your husband or your spouse is in the car and you, um, you die in the process and you die in the accident, who's going to look after your child? These are the kind of directives that you need to have in place. And especially if you've got a child or a spouse that you're responsible for, um, you need to decide and you need to have this documented and you need to communicate this to the people around you that what needs to happen to your child now, who's going to look after your child, etc. So that's where we start the whole process of talking about a living will. Do you have a directive of what you want to happen next? Then the next question of the next thing that we're going to have is an advanced care plan on an advanced care directive. Here comes the things of the living will. And in the medical fraternity, they call this most often the do not resuscitate decree, the DNR. And this is the thing that we're talking about now. Now, as Bonnie and Manoas that knows all these things by heart and we're all practicing all of these things, will know. Um, it's a very, very important document. And for the parents, I want to tell you now, and I want to ask from you, please don't, as a parent, always decide, decide for your child. Take your child in consideration, not about only the cares and, and, and whatever. You need to, if your child is of an emotional age that they can discuss this, this topic needs to be discussed. If your child's got the intellectual capacity to discuss this, please do. Because so often we see children that will readily face the next phase of their life and say and ask from you as uh, the practitioner, am I dying? Why is mommy crying? I'm ready to go. And then it's mostly the parents that will hold this back. But I want us to, to discuss the DNR and, and what it entails. If you think um, the DNR form has been developed for the purpose of informing and instructing the people around you, the medical staff, the paramedics, the hospital physician, the medical staff in the ward, etc. And the DNR actually entails a lot of things. Here you'd say um, measurements must be withheld that include chest compressions, assisted ventilation, um, intubation, defibrillation, uh, cardiotonic drugs, etc. But I've asked um, Kelly, sorry, I've asked Kelly that after we've had this discussion today, that we circulate this form and that everybody looks at it. But now there's certain things that need to be on this form. I've, I'm sending you a template, you can have a look at it. First of all, it must be signed by the patient 
or the guardian or a surrogate decision maker where the declarant or the person is unable to make or can communicate informed healthcare decisions. Communicate is a very important word here. And I can tell you that a month ago, I was in a, in a process when my father died, where I actually had to hand in the DNR. And this is a very, very difficult thing. Now, um, the representative can be the spouse, the parent, other family members, um, a power of attorney or a court appointed person that will actually communicate on your behalf. Now the physician, this is very important, the physician or all the treating doctors that's treating this patient must sign this form of um, affirming that the patient or surrogate has given consent to the DNR instruction. And once the paperwork is completed and it's signed by all the parties, you must have three copies of this form that needs to be distributed in the following way. One copy should be retained by the patient or the family. Then another copy must go to the physician and the doctor. And I want to tell you, you know what, guys? It doesn't help if you give it to your treating doctor. Because as Manas will also, and all of us will know, the doctor isn't at the hospital 24 hours a day. So take another copy of this form and give it to the unit manager in the ward where this patient is. And then a third copy must be used by the patient. It must be kept with them. And you know what I found today, and I actually made sure. Um, you know what? You can have, it is actually legal if you have it as a tattoo. But again, the whole family, everybody must be aware of this. And please remember, it can cause a huge amount of conflict, the DNR. This is, if we think for ourselves or for our children, can you imagine if the husband and the wife or the two parents doesn't feel the same way about a DNR? People, please, this is not a decision that needs to be made lightly. And I would like to urge you, you know what? Get a professional person that's actually knowledgeable about it, that they are there to facilitate this, this process. Because the amount of emotions and conflict that can come into this discussion. I've seen cases where it's actually ended marriages. It's important that this is being discussed and in a very professional, caring environment, not just with anybody. But then again, as Bonnie also explained, your support structure, your family, everybody must know about it and they must be on board with this. You must trust that person that they will carry out your wishes. They are your communicator. Because otherwise, everybody is going to ignore this. Um, I've seen now, in this last couple of, or five weeks ago, that you know what, doctors are actually, and medical staff, are very upset when you give this, this order. For the simple reason, they are trained. They are the people that want to save a life. But the decision must be made, um, when is enough enough? When are we gonna pull it? And then this, Medical staff must be explained to them why you make this decision, why it's in the best interest, and why it's important. And I can tell you, it's damn hard. And you end up in a situation where you actually must explain um, why you want this. But yes, um, they're also judging you. They really are. Because 
They want to save this person. Now, very important, as Bonnie also said, there must be three signatures on this document. Number one, it must be the person that's giving this order, the patient, the guardian, whoever. Then the physician must acknowledge in writing. It's very important. It protects the doctor, it protects you. Then at the station of witnesses, you have two, you need two competent witnesses with a date. If there is a date or, or expiry date to this document, that must be on the document as well. At the moment that you change your mind, you must take the same route, go to the same people and actually say that, you know what, I don't want a DNR anymore. Here it is on paper, I want you to sign it, that you have the peace of mind, that you then will have the active treatment till the very end. Um, that's about the, the main thing that I can tell you at this stage. You will have a template of this. Um, I will also provide a template for a care plan, advanced care plan, care directives, etc. But people, please, be careful who you trust to be your voice. And make sure, on the other hand, that everybody knows in your support structure that this is your, your wish. Very important. But please, don't just discuss it with somebody and say, okay, now we've made the decision. Go to somebody that really understands. Somebody that will treat this with dignity, with respect, with a lot of compassion and somebody that really understands your wishes. But that's about it from, from me now. Um, Kelly, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I'm willing to take questions. Thanks, Petra. Well, I see that there are quite a few uh, questions coming through. The, okay. um, the one question is, what about a situation uh, where there is a very poor prognosis and the parents want to keep fighting, mm -hmm. perhaps to the detriment of the child. When will it not yes. be in the interest of the child to keep on with interventions? You know, those are the, some of the cases that I see that, uh, that, that, that needs to be discussed with a professional. And it's not one discussion, it's not one session with that social worker or the, the psychologist. It's actually a a series of sessions where you need to understand, okay, the one spouse says, yes, I'll sign the DNR. The other one says, no, I won't. Then we need to have a discussion, open discussions, and actually counseling. Where are we going to see why do they feel that? What is in the best interest of the child? What is the perspective of the doctor? What did the doctor say? What is this prognosis? And yeah. the other thing that we have, one of the hindrances, that yes, in Gauteng we have Manas. The other doctors aren't always trained in palliative care. And do they really make a good estimate? I mean, if we talk about prognosis, go to two different doctors, discuss the whole case. But very importantly, the parents need to be guided in this process. It's very important. Okay, uh, Manaz, I'm not sure if you have anything to weigh in on that. I just, yeah, I just want to add in, in these situations, it's very difficult. And yeah. sometimes the only way that I am able to get around it is by explaining to the parents that what they are doing is actually selfish. And it's for selfish reasons that they are holding on to this child prolonging yes. the inevitable. So it's, it's the feeling of how am I going to cope without the child? What am I going to do without the child? And very often it's using that terminology that actually gets them around to thinking that what they're doing is actually causing more harm than good. In other circumstances, that the family has decided to, with, to continue treatment. And it's not just me, but the treating doctors, the ICU doctors, mm. the multidisciplinary team itself have seen that it's detrimental. We actually do go um, above and beyond the parents and actually get a court order. Um, saying that what we believe is 
in the best interest of the child and that we are acting for the child. And therefore, yes. the magistrate will normally sign that. And that's how we, we get around it in very extreme cases. But as Petra said, it's, it's basically communication. It's talking to the parents. It's explaining what they're doing is wrong. And it's you trying to act for the child that has no voice. And the other way I often do it is I often tell the parents, put yourself in that situation. If you are lying there on a ventilator, in a bed, in hospital, all alone, with nobody around you, nobody to love you, hold you, touch you, how would you feel and what would you want to happen to you? And often using those two questions about, um, about the selfishness and putting yourself in the kid's shoes, it actually gets the parents around to your way of thinking or the doctor's way of thinking. And um, I'm not sure, maybe Bonnie, at what, at what age? I mean, is there a specific age where children now be, become, um, uh, what's the word, a more emancipated. Uh, emancipated in terms of this decision making? Or does it, does it revert back to their state of mind? Because, I mean, we all know little Shania, who recently passed away. And for mm. such a young little girl, she was very, very, very clear on what her wishes were yes. and what she wanted for her life. And I think she really sets an example that, uh, I mean, she was wise beyond her years um, from oh, that perspective. Really? Um, I think she was about six. Mm. So, um, and, but her family obviously respected, respected her wishes and she had made herself clear. But, you know, I, I must be honest, I look at my son he's turning 10. I don't think he has the uh, mental capacity to understand the weight of a decision such as this. But at the same time, legally, I don't know if I if it's if it's reasonable for me to continue making the decisions for him. Um, Kelly, so in terms of this from the legal side, uh, the children does actually reg oh, the Children's Act does actually prescribe it. So it's a bit tricky to understand because there's a difference between when it's consent for treatment or when it's consent for surgery. So if it's consent for treatment, um, the age that we work with is under the age of 12 years old and above the age of 12 years old. So if it's treatment um, and surgery, oh, if it's treatment, sorry, if they're above the age of 12 years old, they can consent without the parent. If it's surgery and it's above the age of 12 years old, they need one parent to at least assist them with this. And apart from that, the medical professionals will also um, assess the child um, if the child has sufficient maturity as well. Wow. So, sure. I mean, I, I think to myself that, you know, so I, I wonder why, I don't know if there is, if we have any understanding why the separation in terms of surgery and treatment, but I think something like chemotherapy is probably a, a more impactful than what surgery would necessarily be. And it has a lot of long-term impact in the sense that, um, yeah. you know, many, many chemo uh, children who survive chemo have a really, really um, altered quality of life in the sense that many of them can't go on to uh, have children. Uh, they have short stature, those sorts of things. You know, I, I, it's, it's quite difficult to understand why there's that, that separation. And I suppose it's also the mother coming out in me. I mean, I honestly, I think if someone came and told me my child had more say than me, I don't actually know how I would survive. I think I would need both Manaz and Pietra to <laughs> remove me from the situation because so I, I can just imagine that there's lots of uh, other people that would feel the same way. Um, someone has asked, is a tattoo, um, a, a tattoo, I know that Tulls just had a massive campaign with regards to organ donation. Does that... Does that qualify as almost as written as written consent? No, no, no. Um, no. Kelly, you, oh, sorry, you <laughs> need to have the written consent. You need to have the DNR order, and and that everybody signs this document. But what I've seen is if they have a DNR, if they have a medical medical alert bracelet to also voice their wishes. It just enforces, not enforces, it makes the wish and the order stronger. Because there will always be somebody that asks, but um, yeah, but that was then, that was two years back. This is now, um, would Pietra still feel the same, et cetera, et cetera. If you have, particular, if you have your um, tattoo, I mean, people can see this. 
Um, and I believe it needs to be visible. And the more people that knows and that can see it, the better. Um, Bonnie, do you have anything um, to add there? Kelly, from our side, so I guess we've recently launched a campaign where you can get a tattoo, which looks exactly like our logo. So it's basically two like, um, quotation marks that says that you're an organ donor. The only purpose of this tattoo, why we are promoting it, why we are getting people involved, and by the way, we actually reached 500 tattoos today, um, is to get the conversation going. So it's all about that. If I have this tattoo on me, people always ask you, you know, why do you have the tattoo? What does it mean? Yeah. So to get that conversation going with friends, family, anybody, so that people are more aware of what you want but as from a legal side if they yeah. get you if they find you in hospital or you were just in a car accident and you have the tattoo on you it doesn't mean they can just act on that tattoo no. they'll still need consent from the family before yes. um, removing the organs okay um another question i have a dnr for the instance that i land up in a situation where resuscitation is needed i do not want to be resuscitated but patients oh, well this person's not obviously in hospital at the moment not acutely ill which doctor do you give it to? Because say, for instance, exactly. you live in Alberton and you land up having an accident in KZN, what then? Exactly. Do you, is a, is a, do we keep a written copy in our car in the hopes or in yes. your purse? And is that where things like the, the medic alert bracelets are so relevant? Yes, absolutely. Um, what I would suggest is that you give it to your treating doctors, all of them, and let all of them sign it. The more people that knows, the more people that sign the better but but the key to this is is really information sharing but please you need to have that written document and please once everybody has signed take that to a commissioner of oath because it just give it more power that people can see it's not just some of somebody that signed this document um, and signed for somebody else etc Mike Mike Take all the precautions that you, can't, that you can to make sure that it's legal and that it's a binding document. But with regards to the question, give it to all the treating doctors. Choose somebody that will be a voice for you, that will actually speak to you. Try to have it on you. Um, Kelly and I would actually urge uh, to, to rare diseases like the uh, seatbelt covers that you've made. Yep. Maybe a seatbelt covered. We've actually just recently looked at doing, um, actually doing printed wallet cards, like a almost like a macro Excellent. card, actually a proper printed card that can fit in wallets and bags, etc. Specifically, not only to discuss these sorts of things, but also uh, for yes. um, medical conditions and stuff, because the medical alert bracelet can only take so much, and in exactly. the red disease space we literally have to pick which conditions you want to mention on there because a lot of us have more than one. So, um, yeah. so we, we are actually looking at that. Um, I also, you know, I've, I've just had a school of thoughts and, and it's something that I will now actually think of picking up with uh, the board of healthcare funders and HFA. But my thing is it possibly it would be a good thing for us to advocate for these decisions to be kept on house or on file with your medical schemes as well. Because Absolutely. they're the first people that are going to get a phone call in the event that there's an accident for authorization. So um, I think that that's probably the, the, the quickest way to disseminate any information like that. I don't know if it is available like that. I mean, Bonnie, do you know if, if medical aides keep track of whether or not you're an organ donor? No, according to me, that according from what I know, no, they don't keep track of that. Um, and also, the so you provide your ID to the Organ Donor Foundation which they can use to see if you're an organ donor, but for instance, the transplant coordinators or the hospitals don't have access to that either. Um, yeah, so it is a bit difficult okay, to track so whether you're an organ donor or not if you just wake up or well, end up in hospital, not wake up in hospital. Well, maybe, maybe there's some room for all of us here. Yeah, maybe there's a, this is a good advocacy Absolutely. point, I think, for all of us working in this Absolutely. space is to, to pick that up. Um, all right, and then... Kelly, sorry, if, if I can just come in here and also say that um, just remember you can have this document and you can have it in your wallet, etc. But in the, in the instance of an accident, are you still going to have your wallet with you? So please continue with this discussions yeah. and, and how we, we can make sure that 
people, wherever they are, wherever that they go, that they have their DNR order with them. Okay, um, someone asked, what is, um, does anybody know how common it is in SA for parents to consent to organ donation of newborns and infants? Uh, um, Kelly, according to what I know, or what I've spoken to transplant coordinators, et cetera, the youngest donor was six weeks old. Um, I'm not sure though, from a medical point of view, what's the cutoff line for being called a newborn, but no, the youngest donors have been six weeks old. Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, geez, it's like my, the mind, you think having a newborn child, the, the last thing I think you could possibly think of is organ donation in that. But mm. at the same time, I've just recently become an auntie to uh, twins who were born at 30 weeks. And I think to myself, if either of them needed an organ, what I'd give for them to be able to have it. And obviously they would need newborn organs then mm -hmm. as well. So, I mean, just, wow, yeah, so it's such a tough discussion, but so difficult. Um, Megan made a comment and she just said that um, she's obviously undergone a recent medical procedure with a high chance of morbidity. And she signed both and informed everyone around her. Um, actually, Megan works for us, for those who don't know. And I had a very tough conversation with her in the office and I told her she had to bring it um, the next day so that we had it on record. Um, but she was just saying it was very, very difficult for her to actually even think about it. And it brought lots of tears, but she also didn't want to leave with the possibility of knowing that she would have left her family making a really difficult decision when they were in such a hard position to begin with. So um, I think it was the responsible thing for her to do. But Megs, on this note, I hope you've now notified your doctors that you've withdrawn that. Um, you know, I think it's also something to consider. She's doing so much better now. Uh, at what point do you, do you draw the line in terms of withdrawal of that? So, yeah, I mean, I think that that's it. I just want to do a quick run through here and make sure that I've answered all of the questions. Um, Manaz, in terms of suctioning secretions, would this be considered um, uh, intervention or uh, um, prolonging, prolonging or assisting? I think in this case it would be assisting. I mean, nobody wants to hear that that secretions or that death rattle all the time. And it's a necessary intervention. It's not necessarily keeping the patient alive. Your secretions are basically your saliva that's pulling in the back of your throat. And I think just for ease of the patient, to make the patient more comfortable and to decrease the anxiety of the people caring for that patient, we should be suctioning. Okay, and would that form part of the physiotherapy service if, even if there is a living will in place? Yeah. I would think so. I mean, we often, uh, when we have children with trachees or secretory problems, we do is ask the physios to come and we do ask them to suction as needed. Um, I'm not sure if that would comply with the living will. I mean, Bonnie, any um, idea? Uh, yes, if we if we look at the, uh, the DNR, what I can tell you, just for, um, maybe this is important, the living will that or the DNR order that, um, that Kelly will be sending through is actually one that she um, used by the World Hospice Palliative Care Association. And it has been underwritten by the World Health Organization. For one or other reason, at one of the meetings four years back um, where they had the whole discussion on access to palliative care. Um, this one was tabled and it was accepted by the World Health Organization. Um, maybe Manas, you can have a look at it, you and Bonnie, and see with regards to suction, because yo, I'm just a social worker, I don't understand all the medical terms. So yo, maybe we must have a look at it, but I, um, I would think that suctioning is part of uh, symptom control. That's what I would think. I mean, I've had a, I had a case where a newborn was meant to be born with a lot of congenital abnormalities and wasn't expected to survive. And the treating doctor at the time said, no oxygen and no suctioning. And oh. I actually had a problem with that. Because yes. for me, that's a necessary intervention, not necessarily to keep the child alive or to prolong the suffering, but to make their life or that little time that they have a little bit easier 
Yes. And give them a little bit of quality with the breathing and, you know, just spend, and also just spending time with the family, with the newborn, with the newborn's parents before the child actually passed away. So I actually thought that it was a necessary intervention in terms of just, you know, like sort of like keeping the peace and keeping everyone at ease with themselves. Absolutely. Sure. Wow, absolutely interesting. I'm going to go through all our panelists one last time. Firstly, thanks so much again. It's been so Thank interesting. Um, I can see, I'm looking online, I can see we've got a couple of healthcare professionals that have joined us as well. So that's um, uh, when we sent this notice out to our HCPs regarding this webinar, I was actually quite uh, overwhelmed with how many of them were saying that even as healthcare professionals, they're not necessarily 100% sure on what their rights and responsibilities are or how to even encourage patients or how to have this conversation with patients. Um, so I think that there's also a need for possibly trying to do a CPD discussion around this, specifically Absolutely. for the healthcare professionals. Um, so I'm going to allow you to have any closing thoughts. I'm going to start with Bonnie. Hi. Any <laughs> Yeah, um, I think from my side, as I said, my closing thoughts on this is just once again, actually seen in more than just the organ donation environment, how important it is to talk to your family about any of your decisions affecting your end of life, from what treatment you'd like to receive to, as Pietro mentioned, whether you would want to be cremated, what type of funeral you want. And I think it's important to also arrange this stuff um, beforehand, because I think yes. sometimes we end up in a position where only when we're diagnosed with a terminal illness, we think about these things, but anything can happen at any time. And thank you for inviting me, by the way. <laughs> uh, thank you for being here. Um, Manaz, anything from you? Um, yeah, thank you for having us. And um, I just want to emphasize the fact that palliative care is not reserved for those that are terminally ill or not just for the dying. I think it's, it's important also that palliative care is not associated with death and dying. The, the more we can dispel these myths and these connotations about death and dying and make it less taboo and talk about it openly, it will also help create, um, make the conversations easier about what is, you, what is it that you want when you're dying and your, your plans and things as Bonnie and Pietra have both stated. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Pietra, your side? Just thanks again for inviting me. Um, yeah, and it's an honor to just to have this discussion with, with you guys. And as Manar said, please remember that palliative care is not for death and dying, it's for quality of life. Absolutely. Well, to all the listeners and everyone that's joined us, we will um, be obviously circulating some documents through. Um, we will be sending you the, the contact details of all organizations that everyone's affiliated to so that you can access that information and those resources if necessary. We're hoping that we get more tell, uh, uh, tell um, tattoos done. We're hoping that we get everyone. The result of the poll was that 47% of us don't have an advanced uh, care plan or a living will in place. Um, and I actually quickly, while I've I've still got everyone on the line. Just quickly want to ask the question about organ donation. Um, so I think it just really, really shows us that there's lots of work to be done in the in the living uh, the living will space and the DNR. So we will circulate that information to everyone. And once again, thanks so much to everyone for joining us. I see that two more messages have just popped through. Uh, someone saying thanks very much, very informative. Another person saying thank you so much. And I can see here immediately um, uh, about seventy five percent of us are organ donors and, and all of those that are organ donors seem to have their families well aware of their wishes so that is good news mm -hmm. from all of us so thanks very much everyone i hope you guys have a great evening further thanks once again to all of our speakers for taking the time uh, on this cold winter evening and we look forward to seeing you guys next month hope to see you then yeah. cheerio bye 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 bye